double act. What was that you said again, Sarah? I can hardly hear you over the noise. Right. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm Phil and, and this is Tommaso, we're from uh, UCSB and uh, when we were preparing for this workshop we realised uh, that actually we spend quite a lot of time and effort working on uh, lensing projects that are sort of beyond the obvious, so we were pretty pleased to come and show you some of our, uh, our stuff. Um, so the obvious to you. <laughs> right, well beyond the obvious to me actually means something different I think than for the rest of you because I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, what we can do in 10 years' time with, with uh, various surveys that I'll tell you a little bit about today. So this is really, you know, um, really out there. Okay, so uh, most of the work we'll, we'll talk about we've done in collaboration with uh, uh, these three people, Gilles Orban, Raphael Gavazzi, and Eric Morganson, and also the, uh, the survey team, Slacks, SL2S, and Haggles. All right, so in the next decade... Uh, we expect to increase our, our number of uh, strong lenses by uh, uh, two or more orders of, of magnitude, uh, especially with, with surveys like those done with LSST, Euclid, and, uh, and SNAP, or, or some other JDEM, and also with PANSTARS and, and DES uh, along the way. Um, and this means that these strong lenses will no longer be rare events. We've already heard from Mike this morning that they're already not really rare events. And so maybe we should think about what we can do with these uh, uh, surveys in the future. So here's one um, high resolution survey that's uh, planned, um, uh, SNAP, which is basically you can think of as providing HST quality imaging over a thousand or more square degrees. And the launch date for this would be 2016 if it all goes to plan. And the obvious things we can do with strong lensing with SNAP might include uh, extending the SLACS type analysis to Redshift uh, 1 and beyond with uh, a of 10,000 galaxy scale lenses split up by type and environment. Looking at the weak and the strong lensing together uh, that Raphael already looked at last year. And, um, and then perhaps use the many clusters that we find uh, to look for um, very high redshift uh, galaxies behind them. It's cosmic telescopes. Here's a sort of complementary survey happening at about the same time. Uh, the primary mirror casting started for a LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Um, this is slightly different from SNAP in that it wouldn't provide a static uh, survey, but rather a 10-year movie of the whole southern sky uh, with these uh, properties here. And so you can do slightly different kinds of obvious science with LSST. You can monitor a few thousand lens AGN <laughs> and uh, you know, extend the, the types of uh, uh, AGN projects and, and millilensing projects that, that Chris and Neil uh, have been working on to uh, much higher precision. You can perhaps think of trying to measure Hubble Hubble's constant to uh, high accuracy, and also find lots and lots of cluster and group scale lenses, as, as Mike was explaining about. Okay, but what science will we be able to do beyond the obvious? And uh, then related to that, what, what follow-up observations will we need? So at the end of this session, or at the end of this talk, Tomas is going to open up some discussion about, about the facilities that we might be using and, and how to go about uh, organizing ourselves to, to make the best use of, of these big samples. Okay, so here's our plan. We've got three types of exotic lenses to tell you about. The first two from, from Tommaso and then one from me. And I'll spend a bit of time uh, telling you about how we think we might go about finding such exotic lenses. And then, as I say, the last 10 minutes plus discussion we'll, we'll spend talking about, about follow-up. So. All right, so, so we've been thinking about beyond the obvious in terms of rare events. So <coughs> this means events will be still rare in 10 years' time. When we go to hundreds of thousands of lenses, it will be still at rare events that we know of. So the first one is com compound lenses or double Einstein rings. And an example of this we just found with the SLAC survey. Just to remind those of you in the audience that don't know about the SLAC survey, <coughs> this is a survey that has several benefits. One of them is that there's a well-known selection function. That is, we look through the spectroscopic database of the Sloan, um, and we look for objects that have two redshifts, like an absorption line redshift and some emission lines at a high redshift. This means that there are two objects aligned in the solid angle occupied by this, the Tiber, so it means it's a very good candidate for strong gravitational lens, and in fact, it turns out that most of them are strong gravitational lenses. And it's a two-step project. The first one is 
selecting the candidates based on, Sla on Sloan, and then we follow them up with HST to confirm the storm lines and nature of them. And this is to give you a visual impression of the Slack survey so far. These are the 60 best lenses found by Slack so far. And on the left, you see the, the lens, and on the right, you see the model for each of these 60 lenses sorted in order, in order of lens redshift, so from very 0.063 to 0.05. So these are strong lenses from Slux, but there's one of them that stood out in the special, and this is what we call the jackpot. This is special because uh, if you look at the image, there's not only the strong, uh, bright, high surface brightness ring we've used to select this object, but there's another multiple, multiple image source behind it. And it's very faint, but it's clearly visible in the HST images in many colors. And this is a lens. The main lens is a redshift 0.222. And the, main, the bright source is a redshift 0.6. And the velocity expression from Sloan is about this one. And this is interesting because, as you can imagine, this is an alignment of three objects along the line of sky. So is the second object in the uh, spectrum? This one? Yeah. Uh, no. I'll show you a spectrum of this later on. Not in the slower spectrum. So, yeah. so um, how likely is this kind of event? So one, about 1 in 200, at this depth, about 1 in 200 luminous red galaxies are strong lens. Of those, maybe 1 in 50 is a compound lens or a double line summary. It's slightly, it's not just a product of this because selecting by strong lenses, of course, biases you towards more massive systems. So about 1 in 10,000 LRGs would be a compound lens or a double Einstein ring. So there's probably a few of them in Sloan, and probably several in the whole sky. But it takes you about 50 to 100 strong lenses to find one, and so that's pretty much what we should have expected for the slots, of course. And this is not just a curiosity. We're very interested in this, of course, as you, this audience knows very well, because we can use this to measure the mass density profile of the lens very well. Well, and we could, pro you know, what, you could think also of using this double Einstein ring to measure cosmography, because the, the apparent size of the ring depends on the angular diameter distances and on the mass of the lens, main lens. And so you could try to use this to do cosmography. And since it's a compound lens, the outer ring is also lensed by the inner ring. So you can use the, this perturbation to measure the mass of the inner ring. And this is probably one of the only ways I can think of to measure mass of small dwarf galaxies at intermediate redshift. So, you know, it's not particularly interesting, but something to get out of this. So Raphael spent a lot of time doing modeling of this, and he obtained a beautiful model. But the most relevant results of this model I think for this talk are that if you model the lens as a simple for power law, you get an incredible precision in the measurement. You can measure the slope of the mass density profile to about 1.5%. This is way the redshift for the other, the, the other ring? There's a none, right? No, we don't. This is marginalizing over the photometric over the redshift of the other object. There is a degenerates, of course, but this is marginalizing. See this is our contours. So we know it has to be above four based on the absence of some based on the model and on the absence of lines. And we are now getting multicolor images from HST, so we hope to do a better photo scene. So far we have detection in B and R and I, so we think it's about four or five, that's our best guess. At that time we didn't have the V band detection, so it could have gone up to seven. But so that's a source of uncertainty. So if you have a single multiple image source and you combine that with stellar dynamics, the typical level of quality we have for slugs, slow and spectroscopy, <laughs> you get about 15% constraints on the mass density slope. So you can see one double ring is like having you know, 100 single rings for the purpose of this particular measurement. So it is a rare event, but it's worth a lot in this sense. And you can think about using this for cosmography, of course, because of the ratio of angular diameter distance is dependent on the lens equation. Unfortunately, with one, especially if you don't know the source redshift of the second source, you don't learn much. That's the way it is. But um, 
if you assume that you have 50 such systems and you assume you know the redshift for both rings, you can probably get some pretty good constraints. These were some um, estimates that Raphael did for a paper. And he, this is one, two, and three sigma contours that he is expecting for a sample of 50 compound lens systems when you know the redshift of all three objects. So how do you include it in the fluctuations in line of sight? Sorry? How do you include the fluctuations in line of sight in the matter density? The large scale structure, not in the simulation. Because that was at the R bar is high, or Z92. Have you done this? Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Then we're not going to do this. Yeah, I would be surprised. All this amount. Okay, all right. So maybe <laughs> after. <laughs> is this okay, well, it's a factor of 10 in the effort, so. Uh, is it written up somewhere? Yes. Yes. Okay. Years ago. Okay. So, of course, you have to take into account that there's the inner ring that is doing some lensing. And we use this to estimate the mass of the inner ring. And it turns out that this is equivalent to a rotation of the velocity of about 90 kilometers per second. Mm -hmm consistent with what you get in the television relation. So this can be a way to measure this. The most exotic thing of all is lensing by cosmic strings we could think of. Exotic. Hmm? <laughs> so what does this mean? So if you talk to string theorists like Kochinsky, they tell you that in modern string theories you expect to have macroscopic effects appearing in space-time, and they, they, are, they come in two flavors. You, have, you can expect loop strings and horizon scale strings. Loop strings tend to decay by gravitational radiation, so you don't expect to see them. But those horizon scale strings should be uh, common and should be present in a density that it can be computed from first principle. According to Joe, this is the density in cosmic strings. It's approximately of this order. And the important quantity for cosmic strings is a dimensionless tension, g mu over c squared, where u is the mass per unit length. And um, so we know we have some limit on this from two pieces of information. The first one is the power spectrum of the CMB. If strings were too heavy, they would contribute to this, and so we would see a different signature in the power spectrum, which we don't see. This sets a limit to the string tension. And the other limit we get is, again, from uh, discontinuities in the temperatures map, maps of the CMB, because strings would introduce that sort of signature in the CMB. So current limits on CMB are the string tension is less than 2.7 times F to minus 7. So what, what does lensing come into this is that uh, strings have a particular signature in space-time that make them add like, uh, act like your cut and paste or copy and paste command in your, in your computer. So if you have an image of a galaxy and you have a string going through it, what the, lens is, uh, the string is doing is taking a chunk and repeating it like this. So you do copy and paste, basically. But the interesting thing is there's no magnification, no distortion or inversion whatsoever. So the signature is rather clean. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that, um, of course, if you found one of these things, it would be one of the few observable consequences of studying theories on you know, macroscopic scales, so it would be great. But the problem is that they're very difficult to observe. A few years ago, there was some big noise about this cosmic stream lens candidate. And there were two galaxies with the same redshift, the same luminosity, and so on and so forth. And, but then when they looked at them with HST, you clearly see different morphologies, so this shows that these are not lens by cosmic string. Uh, we could have probably known, known this in, in advance, that this was not a cosmic string lens. I, I mean, most people knew this, because first of all, the image separation is too large, and second, this is not the typical galaxy you would expect to be lensed by cosmic string. Because we know that most galaxies in the universe are faint blue galaxies, are not 
these bright galaxies, the near red, the low red shifts, and there's not much volume in front of those. So most of the sources for lens in the cosmic string would be far faint galaxies. And also we know from CMB limit that the deficit angle, this image separation, must be less than 1.4x seconds. So what we really should be looking for are small deficit angles in incredibly faint blue galaxies. So we asked the question, well, can you measure this and what kind of limits can you give with strong lenses? <coughs> Turns out, so let's first, I want to first show you the kind of phenomena we're looking for just to give you an idea of what we're fighting against. So in this, this is a simulation of an HST image and there's a cosmic string and this and has been put in front of <laughs> most of the galaxies here. Can you tell where the cosmic string is? Yeah. Yes, where is it? It runs through the spiral at the top of the middle that one. Very good, great, okay. <laughs> okay, so this is where the cosmic string is. <laughs> so this, is, this is what you expect. This is a rather high tension cosmos. This is, this is a rather high tension cosmic string, so more or less close to the upper limit of what is allowed by CMB. So what's that? that's what you would expect to find in this case. Most likely, you know, if you're not in the same operation, even closer here. Did you put them all at the same redshift, all this? Or? Yeah, for simplicity. <coughs> uh, there would be a spread, of course, to the <coughs> different redshifts. Okay, so you can compute well, the. Well, no Robert together. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would that spread. <laughs> <laughs> so you can compute the optical depth, etc., etc. And we've done this in this paper, and there are two interesting points. The first interesting point is that you need resolution, right? So don't waste your time trying to do this with Sloan or LSST. All you need for this game is really resolution. And the second point is that once you've sort of reached an area, a certain area at a certain resolution, it doesn't make much sense to go much further that area. Because if there were strings, you would have seen them. And for a given area, there are optimal strategies. You're better off if you spread your area around because of, of course, being horizon long strings, they're very clustered. So. There are details like that, but with optimal strategies, we think that with surveys like Huggles, and this is what Phil is going to talk about soon, you can set a limit that is not particularly interesting, but it's close to being interesting <laughs> on the string tension. But with SNAP, you can possibly do better than has been done with the CMB so far, just because you have enough area and you're starting to go down into the tunnel. So from class is the limit like comparable to this or class? Yeah. We haven't done the calculation. I don't know. I think that the density of radio sources is too low. I think. But there's probably like lots of lots of sources in terms of national sources compared to the number of optical sources square grid. Right, no, that would be nice, having a, you know, a target to shoot for, but they don't. <laughs> so we asked Joe several times, and they don't, you know, could be orders of magnitude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, you may just go down to 10 to the minus 8, and I still have an infinite parameter space to rule out. So that's the original script, is with that's my structure with strings. Okay, so we, we arranged this uh, list of exotic lenses roughly in order of, of, of uh, uh, frequency. So if you do find the cosmic string, <laughs> if you do find a cosmic string, then you do find some pairs aligned along it. So what I'll tell you about now, these higher order catastrophes where the numbers are, are even smaller than that, but perhaps still interesting. Okay, so you may have heard this part of the talk from Roger Blanford uh, before. He's interested in, in particular points in three-dimensional space where if you put a source, 
you get uh, very high magnification or, or bizarre image configurations. And these points are sort of known as uh, higher order catastrophes because the, the conditions for them uh, involve higher order derivatives of the potential, <coughs> higher than just second order. So they're, they're points where the, the gradient of the magnification vanishes, for example. And you can classify them uh, uh, with pictures like these. These are uh, diagrams or cartoons in the source plane where you see the usual folds and cusps, but interesting things happening at, at particular points. Um, the reason why we might be interested in these is one for the high magnification, if it's there, to use them as uh, extra powerful cosmic telescopes. But also, if you do find some, uh, an image configuration that's close to one of these catastrophes, you can use the, the information on the higher order derivatives of the potential to do a detailed map of the, of the local gravitational potential and look for substructure and that sort of thing. So with a, with a very good undergraduate student in the last few months, uh, Gilles Orban, we, um, we tried to compile an atlas of these uh, exotic lenses, just to give ourselves a feel for the kinds of things we might see in these futuristic imaging surveys. And so what he's done is used a, a, um, a ray tracing code to predict images um, using sort of plausible physical uh, lenses, so disks plus bulges, or pairs of galaxies, or reasonably complicated uh, clusters, and so on. And what I wanted to show you about just today is two examples of these, uh, the so-called elliptic umbilic and the hyperbolic umbilic uh, points. And we think that they, these should be, um, if not common, then at least generic in, in binary galaxies for the elliptic umbilic and uh, elliptical clusters for the hyperbolic umbilic. And this is all inspired by uh, these recent surveys, uh, SLACS and SL2S, that are sort of just big enough to be finding the first few objects that might have some higher order catastrophe points lying behind them. Okay, so first, talking about groups and binaries and mergers. Uh, here's a, a system from SL2S where you can just about resolve two uh, elliptical galaxies very close together. And there's a, a cruise form uh, quad uh, configuration around them. And the question was, um, where would we have had to put a source to get uh, something a bit more, a bit more exciting than that? So this is what uh, Gilles did. First, he, he made a little model that was able to reproduce what we actually see in the SL2S image. That's the top panel. You see the, uh, the caustics in the source plane on the right and the critical curve in the image plane in the middle, <coughs> and then some sort of predicted uh, color image that you might see in a high resolution um, imaging survey on the left. Now, then he, then he said, well, what if we put, put the source, instead of in the center of the asteroid, what if we put it in this little deltoid caustic here? And what you see is you get a faint <laughs> counter image here and four merging images in a sort of Y shape here. But we've never seen anything like this. So we did a bit more analysis and, and asked, well, how stable is this deltoid caustic in redshift? So here's a plot of uh, source redshift for a, for a fixed lens redshift. And this is the, um, the caustic structure that you would see. So you start off with um, some six cusp um, uh, asteroid type thing, which then becomes a single uh, four cusp asteroid, but on the way you pick up this little deltoid, which disappears at the actual elliptic umbilic point and then reappears over here. So you can get this funny Y-shaped configuration in this region if you have the source exactly in the, in the hole. And so he did a bit of work trying to estimate the, the, the cross-section associated with this deltoid to try and estimate the abundance of these things, and works out that given what we know roughly about the number of um, binary galaxy lenses from SNAPS and SL2S, his rough uh, order of magnitude-ish estimate is that there might be one observable elliptical umbilic configuration on the sky. Okay, so another another type of uh, higher order catastrophe point um, is the uh, the hyperbolic umbilic, and this was suggested as being. Uh, uh, generic behind uh, elliptical clusters or very elliptical clusters, and it needs to be clusters because the the uh, the slope of the density profile needs to be quite shallow in the in the central parts. And so here's an interesting cluster. This is Abel 1703, and uh, you can see in the in the critical curves that it's quite a, an elliptical, although it's perturbed a lot around the, the actual curves by the cluster member galaxies. And then you can see what the the caustic structure looks like on the, on the right. And so the question. Uh, suggested by Massimoni Aguri is, is Able 1703, an example of uh, a hyperbolic umbilic. And here's a zoom in on the, on the central part of the, of the cluster. You can see this uh, 
this little quad configuration up in the, the, the top left hand corner which we zoom in on you see the quad around uh, a pair of galaxies and then uh, a counter image labeled 1.5 down on the other side of the, of the cluster potential so Gilles made a little model of this uh, with Marouche's help we made a highly elliptical potential and uh, I'm not sure if you can see this in this image but <coughs> it did put in two little um, uh, perturbing galaxy halos here as well so here's the cluster, here are the two galaxies. You can see the caustic structure sort of matches what we see in 1703, and the critical curves are sort of a smooth version of that. And you do indeed see this nice, apparently galaxy scale ring structure here with a counter image on this side. And so then he, uh, like a magician, takes away the two perturbing galaxies, and you still see it here with the nice quad configuration. So it's not a galaxy scale lens, but it's something uh, something close to a hyperbolic umbilic point. All right, so here's the plot of, uh, of what happens to the caustics as you move the source back in redshift. And you find that the, the, this, this closeness of the cusp with the, with the, um, with the ovoid caustic uh, sort of persists the high redshift. So if you put a source somewhere in this gap, you'll, you'll always get something a bit like this ring plus one configuration. So then the order of magnitude estimate, how, how many of these should we, should we find? Well, we're not very good at, well, we're not, we don't understand very well the distribution of cluster ellipticities and core radii uh, that are observed, at least. Um, but guessing the, the fractions for that, and again measuring the size of, the, of the, um, the caustic area where you can put a source to get this configuration, we guess that maybe there's again of order one per sky, this kind of hyperbolic umbilic configuration. So the question for us observers is, is this able 1703 the only one we will ever have. I hope, hope not, but it's good to look for. And if we found a few more, what would it mean? <laughs> well, there's a lot of margin for error here, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's uh, that's an interesting question. But it's I think I like the like you know it's a function of the radial slope, right? Yep. Uh, right. So going to, um, right. So if you see lots of them, you would be you know, saying that if you know if you're saying the clusters radial profiles are per child in the middle and triaxial. Yeah, but I don't know how sensitive a probe it is of the inner profile. Oh, sorry, I don't know how sensitive a probe of the inner profile it is. It might be very, very sensitive. Compared to, say, like, the radial uh, arcs or something like that. Yeah. Can you make that higher than the um, well, this, this one, no. This is, this is a sort of, seems to be relatively uh, stable for substructure, at least in sort of growth probability. I think there's so much margin for error in these numbers. <laughs> I think more the, 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 the catastrophes that seem to be more affected by substructure are uh, the more, on the galaxy scales at least, are the swallowtails. You can make swallowtails quite easily by throwing in substructure. And it's just sort of one end of the, of the binding galaxy scale where one of your galaxies becomes very low mass. But then they become less observable. In all of Gilles' work, he was using realistic sources. So extended faint blue galaxies, and there it's, it's, if you want to see the effects of some of these, these detailed caustic features, you have to be, you know, resolving bumps along Einstein rings. I mean, it's a first order of effect that this has already been found in the I like your optimism, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I think there should be more things like this, and then we're, well, it's, it's high certainly high worth this searching. It's <coughs> a very, very high surface. It's also being high and negative and restricting it to Absolutely, but but you know we've known about them from class papers. That's sort of obvious. This was you know, beyond. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I think generally speaking, it's worth putting in some effort trying to find unusual image configurations. I mean, at least the hunch is that they should tell us something detailed about the potential. It will be fun to work out now, you know, exactly what this kind of thing is able to tell us about the local. Right, so Neil tells us we can't calculate anything about clusters, so I don't know why you're spending time. I, didn't I think say anything. I said <laughs> <laughs> some things we can't calculate. I think I think as long as we don't try and count them too carefully, maybe it's not so bad. I think I'm more interested in finding them and then using them as individual laboratories.
I think that the, the constraint that Marceau finds, he would also get if it was any other kind of radial arc. I mean, this was similar to what the, you know, Sand and Al were, were finding, that there was some sensitivity from the radial arc. Okay, so that, that's our, uh, our three types of exotic lenses, um, or at least the three that we've had, had time to study so far. Um, now I think we thought it'd be worth uh, spending 10 minutes talking about how to find some of these things. And um, for that, it makes sense, I think, to, to go back to asking how we're finding the obvious lenses uh, now, and then how do we need to extend that to find the, the non-obvious ones. Um, so for the for the compound lenses and the strings, it's clear that we need high resolution. We wouldn't have found the um, uh, the second uh, ring in, in the jackpot from from the ground, I think. For the higher order catastrophes, the main thing you need is, is a large area, and maybe you can do um, high resolution follow up once you've found something especially exciting. Um, so at the moment, the way we're finding or trying to find. Uh, uh, obvious lenses or ordinary galaxy scale lenses in the HST archive is with a, a robot um, in the Hagel survey. And it's at the moment, it's, um, the sample sizes are small enough that you can compare it directly with visual inspection. But everyone has their limit to how many things they're willing to look at, so it's worth uh, investigating uh, automated methods. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about um, the kind of filtering that we'll need to do to find cosmic strings if they're out there, and then maybe some thoughts about how we can go about um, finding more exotic lenses at the group scale. All right, so just briefly, I know some of you have seen this before, but this is, um, this is how the Hagel's robot works, trying to find uh, massive elliptical galaxies acting as, as um, <laughs> galaxy scale strong lenses. And the idea is that we're going to optimize for the typical lenses. Now, for the jackpot, we can just say, well, the compound lenses are a subset of the typical lenses. You just have to look a bit harder further out. Um, so what we do is we select bright red galaxies and then model every one of them as if it was a lens. And uh, what the uh, what the modeling produces is four uh, four data data points: one about goodness of fit, another about the uncertainty on on the um, Einstein radius of the mass model that we have for each of these lens candidates. Uh, there's a couple of other. <coughs> Uh, pieces of information as well, and then the, the question is, how do we take those pieces of information and, and answer the question, uh, is it a lens or not? Um, so just to recap from uh, previous talks, this is a sort of illustration of what we do. We make a cutout of a bright red galaxy, we subtract off the, the red light, and then we uh, mask out everything that's not detected, and this is our input, and the question is, are these consistent with lensing or not? And so we make a model varying the Einstein radius of a simple model and ask, do we see a peak in the amount of flux that gets traced back into the source plane as, um, through the lens model? And then from that, we get a predicted source and then a predicted image, and we can compare these two things in a sort of chi-squared way to ask uh, whether the, the fit is good or not. So I said uh, we want to answer the question, is this kind of a gravitational lens or not? It turns out that a much better defined question is, uh, what classification parameter would a human inspector have given this candidate if, it, if uh, he or she had looked at it? And it's, once you switch to that question, it's easier to work out uh, that maybe if you had this probability distribution, then you could work out some estimator for the classification parameter. So at this point, it becomes like educate, or trying to educate a rather stupid child. We have to uh, <laughs> give it some experience. And we do that by simulating large numbers of... Uh, of lenses and, and their images as they would appear in, in the survey of interest and run the robot on each of these and then uh, tell the robot what we actually think uh, that candidate uh, is worth. So we do that with simulated lenses and we do it with real non-lenses. And so for each of our human classification uh, bins, we go from zero to three, uh, three being it's definitely a lens, zero being it's definitely not a lens, and one and two being possibly and probably. And we look at the distribution of, of robot data points for each of those parameters. So this is the, the four-dimensional parameter space. This is for definite lenses, and this is for definite non-lenses. And you can see that the dis distribution of points looks different. And so if we model that distribution uh, with a combination of Gaussians, that's encoding all of the, the knowledge that we want the robot to, to have. Except that if a human was doing this search, then 
what you do in practice is you sit there at your web interface clicking no, it's not a lens, no, 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 no. Oh, maybe, no, 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 no. So we have this prior that we're expecting uh, lenses to be red. And so that appears next to the, the, the probability distribution that we just worked out for the data points of this extra multiplier at the end. So here's one particular prior, one where we know the big green bar showing uh, that we're expecting most, uh, most bright red galaxies not to be lenses, and then for decreasing probabilities of them being lenses. And we can make plots like this that show completeness and purity uh, for the samples of, of candidates that, that, we, uh, that we come up with. So this is for the training set where we know the human classification value, and we're comparing with the robot classification value. So in, for an ideal robot that was reproducing exactly what the humans would say, these would be uh, black diagonals with white off diagonals. So you can see for a realistic prior, we get very pure samples, but they're very incomplete. You can see in this top bin, this 20% uh, 20 20 uh, complete in the definite lenses, but 100% pure on the right hand side. If we change the prior to be more optimistic, as um, some of our collaborators are, <laughs> then you can see that the purity goes way down, of course, as you bring in all these false positives, but it's possible to be a much more complete. And then the question is, well, how many candidates do we have to look through after the robot has done its selection in order to, in, in order to get this complete. So you can read about all of this in, in, in the paper that came out um, recently, but in terms of uh, finding compound lenses, the numbers work out that um, for the SNAP survey, the containing 10,000 strong lenses, maybe 200 of them uh, should be compound. And with the current robot that we're working with with the HST archive, uh, we could get a 100% pure sample of 40 compound lenses with no inspection. And then you can move to 90% completeness if, you, uh, if you're willing to um, reject 93% of, of bright red galaxies. So this is showing that it's, it's, it's feasible to do this kind of lens search with a, with a robot with a small amount of uh, human assistance. Now, this is sort of the easy, obvious problem, right? The BRGs are sort of fairly common. What if our lens candidates are more numerous, like the faint blue galaxies that are lying, might be lying behind cosmic strings? And what if the lenses are too, com too, too complex to be uh, modeled by a, a robot in this way? So here's the plot that um, Tommaso showed earlier of the, what the cosmic string lens candidates uh, might look like. And so we're trying to build a, a pipeline to look for basically uh, this signal, a set of equal separation faint blue galaxy pairs uh, aligned on the sky, and it's the alignment that we're going to use to to try and find um, string lenses. So this is what Eric Morganson is doing at Slack. He's uh, forming pairs of blue galaxies and assigning a, a potential string to each one of them, and then looking for uh, over densities in the Huff transform space for the uh, uh, the alignment and the position of the string in the image. Um, so you can ask me about this uh, at, at the end. This is all sort of work in progress. There's some rejection you have to do if you do find a candidate. And at the moment, we don't know what the false positive status is like. This was Sarah's question earlier, but we'll know perhaps more after the summer. One question for the follow-up is, what do we need to convince everybody that we have actually found a cosmic string lens candidate if we do find one? Is the imaging enough to find a sequence of, of aligned pairs, or do we need to get you know, a spectra for each of these pairs? I mean, it's, it's an interesting question to consider. But just quickly, uh, how might we find these higher order catastrophe lenses? Well, here the, the, the lenses are too complex to be modeled in some simple way. So it seems as though, uh, um, even though you can hope to do quite a lot by <coughs> narrowing down the search by some uh, database queries in these uh, large futuristic surveys, looking for blue objects near red objects, essentially, um, it seems that human inspection is likely unavoidable. And in fact, it's the already happening in RCS, as we've already heard. Um, but just to push that a little bit more, it seems to me that finding strong gravitational lenses is uh, actually an excellent opportunity for, for public outreach. Um, they're pretty rare, so if you find one, then it's valuable. And I think we'd all agree that they're actually objects of, of real beauty. And uh, it's easy to explain their physics, but finding them is also skilled work, so there's some, uh, some reward in, in doing this. In fact, people are already interested in this kind of project, doing uh, galaxy morphologies with Galaxy Zoo. I don't know if you know about this uh, uh, this project run by Chris Lintot and collaborators. Here's the website. 
where you're shown a, a picture of a galaxy from Sloan, and you have to click on these buttons as to whether you think it's an elliptical galaxy or a, a spiral of various kinds or a star or an exotic lens. This is one down here. <laughs> so we're working with the Galaxy View people to try and get this going in time for the big public surveys, especially LSST. Um, but interesting to note that there are already some exciting things turning up on the discussion forum. The people that do these classifications are sufficiently motivated that they'll post interesting stuff and then spend time discussing them. So they rediscovered the 8 o'clock arc in the uh, special lens finding forum. And they also, you know, they'll flag stuff like this that we don't really know what it is, but certainly interesting to, to think about. Okay, so Galaxy Zoo is producing publishable science now. I think this is an interesting thing to think about for finding these, uh, these truly exotic lenses. Okay. I'll conclude briefly by talking about follow-up. So once you know, we have all these beautiful methods to find objects, we have to either exploit them scientifically or convince people that they are real. So what would, what would we like to have in order to do this? Well, we would like to have multicolor high-resolution imaging. This helps in a number of ways, but for exotic lenses, for example, it would be really good to have photosynthesis of the multiple rings and higher resolution image. For example, for the cosmic string candidate uh, CSL1, it was key to go from the ground-based images to the HU, just images to disprove those as cosmic string candidates. So if you can get higher resolution images on a bunch of candidates, maybe you can disprove those as candidate as cosmic strings. And the same thing for exotic lenses, if you want to resolve particularly close images or any sort of things, it's good to have higher resolution images. And then spectroscopy is probably the biggest bottleneck. Uh, you know, you need to get redshift for these things, and redshifts are hard. And you, you may want to get stellar velocity dispersion that's expensive. You need time with telescopes. And you may want to have integral field spectroscopy to do things like um, source studies of highly magnified objects that you may find with exotic lenses. And spectroscopic confirmation of lensing by cosmic strings is probably very hard. Because if we do find lensing by cosmic strings, the sources would be your 0.7 or 0.8 magnitude faint blue galaxy. You're not going to expect all that. So probably the best thing you can do there, unless you're really lucky, is to do higher resolution images and make sure that there's no morphological differences. And the third thing, <laughs> we want time on these facilities, and it's not trivial. So what's the imaging landscape after 2013? So that's the official retirement date for Hubble. And well, it's not necessarily the last word on this, but that's the official retirement date. And SNAP and Euclid, or similar surveys, will probably have worse resolution in Hubble. So we're not going to get better than Hubble. GWST, uh, no, it's of course, 6.5 meters, not <laughs> micro, <laughs> micro <laughs> not <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so, and it, but it will only be diffraction limited beyond two microns. So that means that, at best, GWST's resolution will be like Hubble in the middle. So this is not going to improve our ability to do high resolution. It's going to be OK down to one micron or so. So with this kind of strain, which is pretty good, and the background is going to be lower, so it's probably going to be very efficient still, but not much better than HST in general. So another alternative is adaptive optics. So we're doing quite a lot of work on this at Keck. And so the state of the art as of today is this picture that Phil and I took uh, with the laser guide star, star adaptive optics system at Keck. This is an image of a slax lens, and you see this is one arc second, this gives you a resolution. This image actually has better resolution than Nikos. And at a strand of about 0.3 at 2 micron. So if you just want resolution, all you care about is the, you know, the core of the PSF. So even with that small strand, you can do quite well. Of course, the background is high, but that's OK. So that works more or less like Nikos. What's going to happen in 2013? Well, I think for strong lensing, what we really like to have is high strength over small field of views. Most efforts I'm aware I, I, you know, I, I know of are actually going for the opposite strategy. 
get a relatively low strain of a wide field of views because people are interested in wide field of views. The system I'm most familiar with is this next generation AO system or CAP that is probably the exception to the rule. And here we are going for extremely high strain in narrow field of views. So the goal here is to achieve 90% strain at K. And strain as high as 60% at J. So this will mean that CAC will be better than JWST for high resolution studies and considerably better than HST. This is not funded and you know there's a mere $50 million project, so it may not happen. But if this doesn't happen, it means that for the next, for the foreseeable future, you don't have any facility that is going to go be as good as hot. I think this is a real concern for strong lens. And of course, only one you know, here I'm only talking about the exotic lenses, but of course you can think of many applications where you want higher resolution. For substructure studies, everything you want, you want higher resolution. That's not something that is going to be readily available. And even if it is available, uh, currently, this kind of AO stuff is extremely expensive. On CAC, you can only schedule a limited number of nights because this is very difficult. The systems are not very robust. So it's not an efficient way of using time. And in my experience so far, it's harder to get laser time on CAC than get Hubble time. So it's not a viable alternative at the moment, but it may be the best we have in five years. Of course, giant telescopes like TMT will potentially be even better. So if you have an advanced AO system with multiple lasers, kind of like what you have now with you know, what you were planning to do with NJO, but better. You can go 10 times better the resolution of HST. This is not going to be wide field, so you're not going to be searching for strength with this kind of stuff, but you're going to use this to follow up strength. And you can probably see a lot of details and possible other things. And you know, for these two projects in particular, it will be brilliant, but of course, you know, it will be useful for a lot of applications. Uh, the good thing is that uh, maybe not everybody is familiar with this concept, but for coin sources, in the background limited case, the exposure time scales as good to the four because you, you gain twice. You, know, you get more flux because the area of the telescope is larger, but you also get less background because the PSF is spread on the smaller area. So the gain is quite high. So it's about a factor of 100 in speed going from CAC to TMT. So all the sources you've emphasized are going Well, the, that's right. Exactly. So in, in, Right, in the other cases it would be a factor of 10. But you know, if you're looking for 10 image systems or something and then they're compact, maybe it happens. But so how about spectroscopy now? This is state of the art. So when we discovered the jackpot, I tried to get the redshift of the outer ring and I spent about eight hours at CAC in sort of best conditions with the best instrument and you know, after this is the main lens, this is the, yeah, the foreground galaxy, this is the inner ring, and this is what is left for the outer ring after eight hours of integration. There's not enough signal to get to get the redshift of this. AO may help you here because of course you see these these features are extremely thin. So in the future, if you can do this kind of stuff with AO down to the visible, one of the features of NGAO is that it's going to have high strength probably down to eight or 9,000 angstroms. So if you can do that kind of integral field spectroscopy with that kind of facility, that's gonna help you solve this kind of problems. <coughs> but so far, I think this is beyond what we can do. And so I think this is a general statement that for all these lenses, the 10,000 or 100,000 lenses Phil is gonna be talking, it talked about, there would be no time to do spectroscopy. So we will have to extract our science from photometry only. And that's something we have to live with. But maybe for exotic lenses, maybe we can do something about it. So for example, if we wanted to uh, follow up 50 compound lenses with CAC to that kind of depth, my, my experience is that kind of depth, you have about one in three chances of getting the right shift because it depends on whether the galaxy is an initial line or not. It does, you have a redshift, it doesn't go. But that's you know very rough. 
So if you have 200 compound lens system candidates, you follow up 200 of them, maybe 50 of them, and you can get friendship for a substantial fraction. So this would require a order of 50 or 100 nights of camp time. You're not going to get that. So that's out of the question. With TMT, this scenario scale only as one effort d squared because you will extend the sources, but you can probably do it in five nights or so. JWST is a good thing. I think um, depending on the redshift of these things, it may work very well for so spectra and it should be much faster. So that may be the way to go. So I haven't done a calculation how long it would take with JWST, but maybe that's what we should do JWST for and AO to do imaging. Okay, so just to open the floor to discussion, I think, we, I think we clearly need some high resolution imaging and spectroscopy to expand <coughs> beyond the obvious lenses, but we want that also for obvious lenses. And I'm a bit worried because space facilities are not improving. AO could be a viable alternative, but we're not quite there yet. And even if we've solved the facility problem, I'm not sure we've solved the manpower because we'll be drowning in so much data that we have to come up with smarter ways to um, analyze data. I think one of the key requirements we have to be aware of that when we build the next generation of telescopes, a substantial fraction of the budget should go in building pipelines and software for the analysis. The old model where you go to the telescope, there's no support, you write your own pipeline, is going to break down. We're not going to be able to do that much longer in the future. And so, you know, for people that are involved in planning facilities, I think we have to really convey the message to funding agencies and people that not only we need operating funds, which is what generally is not given to us, but also we need software and manpower to explore these facilities. There's no use in having one billion dollar telescope and then all your data lying you know, on DVDs because you don't know how to reduce the data or you don't have time to do it. I'm not sure I agree with that statement. All right. Well, it's the beginning of a discussion. <laughs> okay. You could spend ten thousand dollars and tell the tax to actually close the loop on what people do with their data. And you don't get more time until you've actually done something with the data that's sitting on TV. Yeah, but I think it's a general problem that we are having already. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's not clear to me that on the next generation of telescopes, the instrument, that the data that comes off the instruments is any more complicated than the data that's coming on telescopes now. And there's a lot fewer nights on those big telescopes, even if all the ones that are planned get built, than what we have now on current large But in general, photons collect the photon. The photon per star. Yeah, but this is an x-ray astronomy. It's not uh, like, we don't I don't know. It. Well, you have your own experience in our CS2, right? What yeah, is which, is, which is we could use more manpower. That's exactly, that's a bottleneck, isn't it? Yeah, Publishing absolutely. papers, right? Absolutely. But and Howard told me he had to write a pipeline to reduce the data itself. Yeah. Right? So isn't that something, you know, wouldn't it be better if all the users of Megacam Yeah, they did. It was called Pit Terrapix. It and it would work. work. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. They're underfunded, probably. Or no, there's not enough, spent quite a lot of money on it. <laughs> or there's not enough pressure from the community to get, you know, one of the things we learned from Sloan is that if you have a very good pipeline, very good data set, it gets used much more than if you just give people the data and, and let them figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to, to in order to maximize the science output, the capital to software to manpower distribution of investment has to be planned more carefully. Than yeah, but I think it actually what it requires is having good people not spending more money. Yeah. Good people who pay money. Yeah. Not so far spending money. Spend money. <laughs> <laughs> That's is the real problem. Chasing after the money that has to do the people, it takes up more and more time for the people. But I don't think it's just money. I think it's getting the right people into astronomy and keeping them in astronomy. In fact, it's yes. really hard. I can't get those stars to work on this stuff because there's no career stars. Yeah. I think that's the real problem here. Really. Yeah, this is not really a money problem. This is a, it's a career problem. A career. The community doesn't recognize this problem. There's some obvious Sorry? <laughs> 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 they 
So, I mean, as an example, okay, name the U.S. telescope project that spent more money than any other. Gemma. Have you tried to use their production packages? <laughs> no. In my experience, it's, it's not clear that spending that money had the payback that you would have hoped that it would have. Sure, no, it's not as simple as spending money. I agree. I mean, <coughs> spending money in a smart way, retaining convincing right people to spend time writing pipeline. But that's really... Most of my colleagues who use Gemini basically write their own pipeline after they try to use the Gemini pipeline and go, oh. But do they then feed that pipeline back into the Gemini community so that everyone can use it? I don't know. Because it takes a lot of effort to write a program that you made for a specific application, make it generic enough and flexible enough and robust enough that other people can use it. So maybe there can be a hybrid model when, once you develop some it might be a better place to spend the money. To, once you develop to close that loop. You know, once you develop something that it gets handed over to some professional software developer or something, you know, packages that, you know, patches the holes and all that stuff. But I think that's a real problem there. Yes. And what about doing this in the radio to get the resolution? Is that no good? Is that obviously wrong? What, what? I haven't thought about radio much, so. Perhaps it's your signal. I don't know how long you have to sit on one of these, you know, a compound lens, for example, to see the second source as an ordinary, just seeing the radio emission from the star forming region. Yeah, they're mostly spirals, right? Sorry? The background galaxies are spirals, so you should be seeing the neutral hydrogen in the Right, but I don't know how long yeah, you there have are to sit on them. So with the SKA, then you should, so depending on what calculation you believe, then um, you should be seeing you know, 10 to the 9, whatever, galaxies out to shift 2, just ordinary galaxies yeah. with that sensitivity. So if they're lens, that can only help. Yeah. So some of the SKA prototypes might be useful, I don't know. So we have modeled this lens that is a it's not a point source, it's an extended source. And we have not it's the ones we've got here. Well this kind of stuff you find. So we did a lot of comparison with different PS labs and stuff. All you care really for this system, at least for the kind of analysis we've done, is that you map well the ridge here. That's all you care. And, and for that you don't care too much about the solar That's a what one arc second on this kind of range? This is one arc second, so yeah, it's about one arc second. Surface brightness? Well, it's in, I, I don't know off the top of my head. But one of the main communities driving the next generation AO are the uh, people who want to measure 
uh, stars around the galactic centre with high astrometric accuracy, and they care deeply about the, the structure of the PSF. And so I think a lot of the NGAO development is all about mapping the PSF over the field. And so I would think that, that you'd be able to do a lot better than, than we got away with for, for this project. But they, the galactic source center is, but you need a, a, a reference source nearby to do that. That's possible. Laser. You need a tip tilt source. And I think the argument's on that. How much you guys mean? How much you need to fix it? It is true that the PSF modeling is quite sensitive to where your tip tilt stars are and how far away they are, how bright they are. So it yeah. works better for some targets than others. So what, sir? Have you, have you trained the robot to uh, detect contaminants or to exclude contaminants? Like yeah, that? so we, 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 we tell it our own classification. So if it's, a, if it's a spiral galaxy, obviously not a lens, then it gets a zero. Just as much, you know, it, but it, that's true. It's the same classification as a, you know, a blank sky, a plane elliptical would also get a zero. And the is if you have two galaxies, that are near each other, right? So mm -hmm. like the, the, the original potential cosmic Um, we haven't subdivided our classifications to say, you know, this is a this kind of contaminant and this is that kind of contaminant. It's something we could do, but at, at, the, at this level, we, we've just, you know, yes, it's a lens, no, it's not a lens, with some grading. And I don't know if that's ultimately useful in the sense that your robot will run in data. I mean, I was interested to see that you ended up picking the same number of class divisions that we did completely yeah. independently, so zero to three. And, and that's to first order about the amount of information you have in these imaging surveys where you're seeing things kind of right on the edge of detectability. And that sort of throwing this weird companion out has to happen with all of the data. And, you know, it's graduate student work, not robot work. Mm. <laughs> I think understanding the contaminants would, I mean, contaminants would be a way of <laughs> extending the, the space of, of robot output data. So if it could come up with some number that, that was high for its a spiral compared to low for its some other kind, then that might be useful in, in you know, it would be more information for the robot to use. And at the moment it's doing something pretty basic. Great. Thanks. Looks like uh, Helen's uh,